Welcome to Evening Rounds, a podcast that takes you behind the scenes in medicine. My name is Dr. Anthony Hilliard, and tonight I am joined by Dr. Ngozi Izinwa, a lifestyle medicine physician here at Loma Linda University Health. Dr. Izinwa brings a global perspective to medicine, from working with the World Health Organization in Geneva to her time at the Red Cross doing tsunami relief work. Her collective experience has shaped how she views health and whole person care. We talk about the importance of stepping back to create space and time for her patients to discuss their needs and celebrating the small victories in chronic care management. I walked away from this interview captivated by her as an individual and understanding why she is so beloved by her patients. If you like what you hear tonight, please subscribe. Ngozi, I'm just thrilled you're here with us tonight on our Evening Rounds podcast. There's so much to talk about, and Kelsey and I are going to dive right in. The one thing I do know about you, I don't know a lot about you, but the one thing I do know about you is that you weren't born here at Loma Linda. That is absolutely true. I was born a long, long time ago (laughs) in a distant land (laughs) called New Zealand. So I'm from New Zealand, and I just came um, here to the United States 11 years ago. Wow. It sounds like when you lived in New Zealand, you took advantage of every last opportunity to be outside, to surf, to run. Tell us a little bit about uh, how active you are. I don't think that I'm special in any way for that, actually. I think it's just sort of the default when you're growing up in New Zealand. It was, you know, less than an hour, similar actually to Loma Linda, less than an hour to the ocean and, you know, about an hour or so to the mountains. So, Mm -hmm. and um, I grew up in a small... Um, a small city and actually even rural <laughs> from that in a, on an orchard. So there was horses next door and the milk sort of came from the farm across the road. So looking back, it was an amazing way to grow up. Yeah. That sounds like a magical childhood that I'm sure you had. How did, how did that growing up on a farm and in that environment, how did that lead you to medicine? So I think actually that it wasn't so much where I grew up as who I grew up with. Mm. And I've got to credit my mum. Although <laughs> when I did say that I wanted to do medicine, she said, well, you could be a social worker. They really help people. And it's a lot less years of training. <laughs> but she, um, she is from the Netherlands. She's Dutch. And my father is from Africa. And so she brought me up to be a bridging person mm. and to be able to look after Um, people and feel comfortable with a lot of different people from different areas. And I think that that um, sort of wanting to be able to help people and wanting to be able to be a bridge builder is what brought me to medicine. Some of it anyway. I love that phrase, bridge builder. It's beautiful. Yeah. You know, I think as I was learning about you, I saw something that, you know, sort of stuck out to me. And that was that you jump out of airplanes (laughs) and it was plural. So that implies that you did it once and then you made the decision to do it yet again. And thereafter, (laughs) tell, tell me about, uh, you know, the drive that says, I want to go jump out of airplanes for fun. I think actually the first time was, um, it was a gift for my 20th birthday and it just sounded like fun. And, um, Already, I suppose, the way we grew up, there was we were surfing and um, swimming and being at the beach and doing um, extreme sports that I didn't know was called extreme sports until we came here. (laughs) Um, And so it was, it was fun. And it's one of the only things that my mum has actually said, you know, maybe you may not want to do that too often if that's all right. Because they offered that I could become the photographer and I thought it'd be great because I'd get my jump count up. Wow. So because each time somebody jumps, you can take a photo of them. But um, I stopped after that because she, she's never asked me not to do something. Yeah. So. <laughs> How has having four children impacted your skydiving time? <laughs> yeah, I'm never. It's all about them now. Yeah. And I must say that most days are just as much of an adventure. And um, <laughs> I totally agree with that. <laughs> and they're great. And it's also really lovely to be able to, you know, we have this uh, concept of service. 
And I think that we can have high notions of serving the world and serving underserved populations. And really sometimes it's those who are closest to you that, that get the dregs of you. And so being able to serve as a, as a wife and a mother and, and a daughter um, brings a lot of joy. So you spent your childhood in New Zealand uh, and young adulthood, it sounds like, and uh, studied medicine. You ended up in the United States. Tell me about the journey. Mm, there's not really much to say. Hopped on a plane and arrived. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask it a different way. <laughs> Growing up where you grew up with your milk across the road and an orchard, that seems like heaven to me. That's what mm -hmm. I've tried to recreate in my own life here. What was the drive to come to the United States? To be completely honest, it was not Korea or um, anything productive. It was a boy. <laughs> it's uh, always a boy. So there's a story <laughs> behind <laughs> it, every move. <laughs> and um, I'd met him in New Zealand and... Um, he wasn't ready to move to New Zealand. And initially I wasn't ready to move to the United States either. But um, um, we decided that this was the best place to mm -hmm. settle and raise a family. And so here I am. So the move worked out? I would say so. <laughs> 11 years, four kids later, I hope so. <laughs> awesome. It was the boy for you then. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm very blessed to, to be here. That's awesome. Was that hard transitioning from all the studying you had done in New Zealand to then having to come to the States and kind of start in a different direction and redo a lot of that training. How was that? Yes, I think there were some moments. I remember um, <laughs> having words with God when I was sitting <laughs> in a library in um, Fontana and trying to remember molecular genetics when oh. I'd, you know, graduated wow. um, from in New Zealand, it's six years of medicine, so you do um, three years as a Bachelor of Human Biology, and that's sort of the pre-clinical, and then you do three years clinical. And then I'd done um, four years after that as well, and so I didn't remember a lot of molecular genetics. So it was a good refresher. Wow. I was a little frustrated having to do it again, but I did my first couple of USMLEs in the first few months of being here, and then um, went and did a... Actually, then my mentor in New Zealand said, you know, you're not just going to walk into a residency there. It's, you know, you need to either do some research or do uh, a master's. And so I'd already been uh, passionate about uh, working overseas in, in different areas. And, um, and so I did, uh, I applied for a master's in public health just two, two weeks before the applications closed. So I just applied to two places and was lucky enough to be able to go to um, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And that's where I first started as a master's and ended up doing preventive medicine, residency and family medicine, uh, where they have a combined program now with those two. So then we spent six years in Baltimore. Wow, that is an incredible amount of training. Mm -hmm. I, I can't even imagine that. I think it continues. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think mm -hmm. that the day that I've learned enough is the, well, think that I've learned enough is the day I should retire because I think we always need to be learning. I couldn't have said that better uh, for <laughs> sure. You spent some time with the World Health Organization. That sounds amazing. And, and I'd like to understand, um, I presume it was part of your, um, experience at John Hopkins, but uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, um, it wasn't very long. It was a the opportunity to do an internship with the World Health Organization in Geneva was part of my sort of fellowship at, at Johns Hopkins, and it was through an alumnus who um, lived and worked over there, and so I was able to go and intern um, in Geneva for a couple of months, which was great. And what did you do? So I was working um, on a project called African Partnerships for Patient Safety in the Department of um, Patient Safety and a little bit in non-communicable disease as well. And there were several projects um, looking at networking between different university sites all over the world that connected with the World Health Organization and then also partnering um, institutions in the global north, so sort of affluent countries partnering with a hospital in the global south, so a, a situation which was resource poor, and seeing if they could actually do a, a round 
of patient safety, a uh, sort of a quality improvement cycle. And it was amazing because there was so much bi-directional innovation. I think that both, um, both sides learned so much through the exchange. And the idea that is that it's sustainable. So it's not just a one-off thing, but they actually build a connection and can do research together and can do many things together. Is there something from that time or a patient story or, or a really impactful thing that that work did that you can kind of look back on with a lot of pride from that time? I don't think any one thing that I did would give me a lot of pride, but I think that the biggest thing was learning how important a team is. Mm -hmm. I think that um, as with most of the global health initiatives, I feel that I helped a little and learned a lot. I just learned so much. And there are so many people that have put in, you know, years and decades and lifetimes of um, work trying to build these things. So to be able to try and implement a sustainable model was really, um, that impacted me a lot. <laughs> so not only the World Health Organization while you were at Hopkins in Baltimore, but you spent some time at the National Institutes of Health. That's right. In the um, Office of Global Research, um, I had the opportunity to be an ORISE fellow. So again, it's just for a few months and um, I was working, it's within NIAD, the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Disease, um, that there, within that is a global component. So I actually was working on schistosomiasis and other tropical, neglected tropical diseases, they, mm -hmm. they call it. And that, again, was um, a real eye-opener. I learned so much about how much the United States is doing globally and how many diseases there still are that are completely preventable or treatable but is still taking people's lives and livelihoods and quality of life. Mm -hmm. It feels like you kind of have always had that global approach uh, to health. And I know um, I've seen that you were a part of the Red Cross response to the tsunami in Indonesia. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes. It, um, I think that might be what sort of sparked my interest in public health. And I went over with an, uh, a team, a surgical team, after the tsunami. Mm -hmm. And I was the most junior member. Um, I was on the, the track to do orthopedics, but you start as a house surgeon where you're the one who manages the hypertension and the diabetes. And, and so going over there, we actually found that it was that people had lost their medications in the tsunami or they were in camps, they were displaced. Wow. So yes, there were some broken bones, but a lot of people actually, you know, if your bone was broken, you were most likely carried out to sea. So um, there was a lot of need for, for the basics, um, for general medicine, for family medicine really. Um, but it also showed me that the population impact and there were supplies rotting in Colombo, um, which is on the West Coast while we were on the East Coast. And because of civil unrest, they were not in a lot of politics they were not getting to the people who needed it so that made me think it's more than just going over and you know helping one person and looking at a systems level is really important and that's what's back to that interest. Wow. That's interesting that your first sort of role as a surgeon was managing chronic disease and that's become a specialty of yours. Uh, integrating uh, lifestyle medicine into chronic disease management. Did that spark the passion that sort of drives you today or? I don't know. I went on, um, you know, four years on the orthopedic track, I guess, before I, um, before I saw the light for, for my own career. Um, but I definitely think that whole person care and being able to uh, have the opportunity to really practice whole person care here in La Melinda is very inspiring and very uh, the way that I feel medicine can be and should be. And here in La Melinda, I really feel that we're standing on the shoulders of giants, mm. both in both the global health world and in the lifestyle medicine world. So what a perfect combination because La Melinda's... Uh, 
a thought leader in lifestyle medicine and with the Adventist Health Study has also really put a huge amount of work into um, uh, translational research and bringing the concepts to uh, the people who need it the most. And then also with the amazing network of hospitals all over the globe and just this generations and generations of service, combining the two and bringing lifestyle medicine to underserved populations, that's really, that's a huge passion of mine. That's what would be phenomenal if we can do that. I'm so glad you're here for, you know, those that don't know, this is really kind of the epicenter for that here at Loma Linda is that lifestyle medicine. If you could, for for our listeners, just talk about what lifestyle medicine means. It's kind of a newer term. And so there's so much that goes into it. Tell us a little bit about how you practice that. Yes. So thanks for asking. I think that it is a newer term and it is really important to define it in the fact that it's really within the house of medicine. It's very evidence-based, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it's not predominantly pharmaceutical based. So it's looking at the things as well as, or, um, or before going straight to medications or surgery, looking at what can be done through diet, through exercise, through connectedness and spirituality, through sleep, all of those things, and looking at how that can impact our health and where the leverage points for change are. And then as well as that also, obviously, being realistic with, with medications. And it's it's really powerful. And I really believe that it's the way that um, we can bring God's kingdom to earth as much as possible, actually, in, in looking at true deep wellness. What do you think is your biggest community health struggle right now as you face chronic disease? Is it diet? Is it access to healthcare opportunities? What education? Yes, that's a really good question. And I haven't thought about it um, in those terms, but I think time. Time, I feel, is the most valuable, non-renewable resource. I can't take credit for that. I think it was in Brene Brown's book that I just read it that we're doing with our residents. I think that's how she termed it. Um, But people are so busy and they feel so busy in that rat race of having to work hard, having to um, provide for their families, that convenience food is much easier to get and much faster Um, and the same with you know exercising feeling that you don't have the time to exercise let alone the time to spend quality time doing nothing with your loved ones so I think time is the greatest barrier Mm. absolutely I could not agree with you more I think that's that's really interesting to kind of look at how the time plays a role in our health and I've read that you are up before dawn. <laughs> um, so how do you kind of live that in your own life? Or how do you see kind of those impacts in your own life? So I am not the best example of lifestyle medicine today because I've been up more or less since about 2 o'clock with my baby wow. <laughs> last night. And you have four kids, right? Four kids, oh yes. And God. the little one is 10 months old today. And he is an absolute gem. And he wasn't crying or anything, but... You know, he'd just be, he'd be trying to sleep and I'd feed him and he'd just be, you'd hear from his cock go, ah, ah, Lala, Dada. Ugh. And then he'd wait for a little while. And he'd be like, I'm sure somebody's ready to play. Yeah. <laughs> so um, in my own life, I would say that just like um, hesitating to come here and marry the love of my life in the same way God kind of needed a sledgehammer before it got through to me the importance of time and it was actually a complicated pregnancy and I Mm. had to have bed rest Mm. and during that time I loved being able to be there I got to know my children in a whole different way and they set up their homework stations around um, my bed in the bedroom and um I think that that also made me more appreciative of our health and more committed to really achieving 
balance rather than just talking about it and wow. still, uh, uh, yeah, living the rat race. Yeah, I saw a quote the other day that said basically, you know, to be busy is so selfish because, you know, we really do have to take that time and really protect it. Mm -hmm. And that's what the most successful people are doing. So I, it's really amazing to hear that that really equates to health for you. But you must have to be really dedicated if you have four children and a, you know, a thriving practice and you're always committed to your education and your growth. So that's, that's incredible. Thank you. You, don't get it right. Yeah. I don't always get it right. <laughs> Your comment, though, you know, the non renewable um, sort of asset, if you will, is time, you literally gave me chills uh, because that's something that I think a lot of us struggle with. I need to understand a little more for, from you as to how do you go about managing your time? And even, even talk to us a little bit about what chronic disease even is. Okay, thank you. So, I think chronic disease is really the things that, if not managed well, are with you for the rest of your life. Um, and some, unfortunately, you know, we don't have good solutions for, like cancer. But then also there are things like high blood pressure, diabetes, um, being overweight, um, obstructive sleep apnea, things like that. And so some of the things that, I often work with my patients on is first and foremost them identifying what is important for them and then what having health means to them. And then from there thinking about how can they um, look at their time and prior start prioritizing their health and sometimes in small uh, measurable ways. For instance, um, somebody might say, you know, I just, I haven't got the time to make a, a healthy meal every night, but then maybe just getting a prepackaged salad for lunch or throwing a little bit of, you know, frozen berries and some kale into a smoothie in the morning, maybe something that is, um, is doable, both financially and time-wise and help them to start prioritizing their health. Or it may just be taking five minutes out of their day for time on their own, having a, a nice bath or um, taking the time to sit and pray or um, taking a walk, even just a five-minute walk. I've done it myself. And, and then you can celebrate at the end, say, yes, I managed to make it out for, for just five minutes. So I Sorry, go ahead. So it's go really see. just, it's small changes. It's very small and you can kind of start small. I think a lot of people probably think that they have to impact their health with huge lifestyle changes, but you're saying it's really, it's those small things that matter in the, in the beginning. Absolutely. And I think long-term because a small change that you can maintain is far more impactful than changing the way you eat and deciding that you're never going to eat chocolate again for your whole life mm -hmm. and then thinking about it nonstop for the next 24 hours and maybe not eating for a few months and going back to it. So those small things, if it can be sustainable, the sustainability mm -hmm. is the, the big thing. And I've seen that those small steps towards improvement provide patients hope and provide the success for the next success. If you say you need to lose 60 pounds and your, your success is measured at pound 60, I don't right. think you have a chance, right? Exactly. If you see two pounds come off, I can do this, right? Yes. So I think that's a very powerful message for our patients. Yes, and I think our patients are amazing because um, that continuity of care, that here in Loma Linda you can often see the same provider and many of our wonderful providers have been here for many years and so they know that that's part of their healthcare team, that to empower somebody that they're the head of their healthcare team, sort of that sort of person-centred care and then um, that as a physician we are one of the members of their healthcare team. I love that. In my mind, there are certain things I do to try to stay sane. And if I don't, I kind of feel myself losing control. You are a woman with a very successful career. You certainly have a busy family, four kids, um, and you know other 
interests too. So where do you find your center? How do you recharge? Thank you for asking that because I think that that does hit to the heart of, of who we are. Um, I, in fact, sitting out there before we started filming, I was um, looking and just writing in my um, diary. I try and take very seriously um, the concepts that Steve Covey writes about and thinking about how do I schedule my time to spend time in quadrant two activities, which are activities that are important but not urgent. So to really connect for me, what I schedule first in my week every week is time with God, um, time for prayer and meditation and time for devotions with the family. Um, I think that is the biggest um, sort of linchpin for me. And then the second um, one would be uh, exercise, which is also a little bit of blue sky thinking. That's where if I can just, oh, I used to run, now it's more like a walk run, kind of joggish. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and that's, that's very special time as well. Um, and so if I can do that, you know, four or five times a week, that, those are something important. And then time, f actually, um, we call it free play. So just having time just to be silly with the family. Do you think a lot of that is kind of informed by your childhood that you had in New Zealand? Or, or where do you think kind of that drive to make sure you have those quadrants mapped out comes from? Yes, I think, yes. I think I can thank my grandparents and my mum and um, a lot of the people who were around me growing up because that was the norm. Um, and then somehow along the way I lost it and so just really reading and bringing it back now. And now, of course, everything sort of has to be analytically justified as well as just what you did when you were little. So there's huge body of evidence and really good research as to the the importance of of a grounded practice or something that is very meaningful in your own life and then prioritizing that and then having that time around it. <laughs> I love it. So there's something you may not even be aware of uh, as someone who looks at dashboards and, and metrics and things like this as part of my job. You are our only physician on campus that has a perfect five-star rating oh. from patient satisfaction. You are like the diamond. Huh. Right. And so I can't miss an opportunity to figure out your secret sauce. <laughs> you know, it's, it's phenomenal. There is not a single star that's a four out of five on every single evaluation. Every single patient evaluation for which there are well over 100 are perfect. Wow. Well, thank you. No, thank you. I love that, I love that you didn't even know that. <laughs> I'm the one thanking you. So that's, that's incredible. And the comments, mm -hmm. you have a number of patient comments and they speak a lot about what you talk about here today, about your own life. And, and I was thinking about what you were saying and reflecting about what's been written about you by your patients, and it's very superimposable. And that's incredible. Now, probably as a result of this podcast, you're going to have a wait list for patients getting in to see you, which they... Based on your scores, there should be a wait list. But really, I want to understand how you practice medicine. I feel that I practice medicine the same way as anybody else. Um, I don't think I ever want to go on that page and have a look at the comments or anything because, you know, it might change tomorrow. And I feel that um, sort of popularity is kind of as fickle as a rainbow in oil. It might be here and gone the next, but... Um, uh, I do think that meeting somebody where where they are is the first step. Um, I take 
time <laughs> um, to listen. And I just, I want to thank all of my team because I am, I struggle with staying on time because if there's somebody who needs to talk or there is a crisis in their life, then I often do run over and um, and everybody has been phenomenal about that. So thank you to the whole team and, and all of my MAs. And um, I also, I think I'm, I'm honest, I don't know everything. And family medicine, you know, some people think it's an easy specialty to go into, but going from orthopedics where I wanted to do upper limb and hand surgery, you can learn more and more about this and this. And so um, you can feel that you know quite a lot about the hand and, um, and the hand surgeons that we have here are phenomenal and really do. And in family medicine, I, there is not a day that goes by that I, there are, I don't have questions and things that I need to learn myself. So I think that's really humbling. And I think that it's, um, I'm honest with that. I, I know what I know and what I don't know. Uh, I don't have a good answer. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> well, and I love my patients. And one of the comments that that was reflected, you know, they said she really took the time to speak to me and to speak to me like I was a friend. And I am sure that that takes so much. That mean, it must mean you're charting late into the night probably if you're spending that extra time. And I love that how we're going back to the commodity of time. Um, but that truly, you can see that in those, in those comments. And it's, it's unbelievable to see. Some buzzwords. Since you won't read your comments, I'll, I'll share a little bit. Uh, listening. Advocate. Confidant would be three words, I think. Yes, I think that we actually have a really lucky and important role as um, healthcare providers to advocate for our patients. And I don't mm. think that we realize how powerful that can be. And um, uh, the San Bernardino chapter of the California Academy of Family Physicians has done a lot um, to advocate for patients and the fact that we have the SACS clinic and great leadership and... Um, just even the fact that Loma Linda is invested in the community enough to really advocate for great quality care is incredibly important. And then if you advocate for a patient, you're, you're changing the lives of, of hundreds and hopefully thousands of patients rather than just um, one. Is there a patient that you've worked with recently that you've seen kind of your impact on or your um, your time that you've spent with them that you've seen really great outcomes that comes to mind just in general without obviously sharing their name? It absolutely warms my heart and makes my day when um, somebody is able to feel empowered enough to change their life and whether that's losing weight or um, you know, I've had somebody who lost over 60 pounds and was able to come off their medications for diabetes wow. and their medications for hypertension. Um, just this week had somebody who's ongoing, just, just losing weight and gaining their life back. Um, so that's been incredibly um, a powerful journey and um, that they're willing to share. I've also, um, I feel inspired also by some of my people that have been able to come off um, in, a, in a, an addiction. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but then are willing to share their story with somebody else who, you know, is, is in the midst of struggle, their struggle. So those have been very powerful. Um, yeah, I, I have lots of stories. I, I hesitate because I'm scared that I'll let a, a, a detail slip that will be non hipper compliant. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> when you wake up each morning and you're getting ready to face the day, what is your mantra? I don't think I have one mantra for everything. I think that just that piece of knowing that God has a plan is incredibly important. And then I know my godmother actually gave me a verse, which is, goodness, is it first or second Timothy verse seven, that 
you know, God did not give you a spirit of timidity, but of courage, love and self-discipline. And that is definitely something that I aspire to live by. Um, I did used to be extremely shy, so it's been a <laughs> really a long process. Um, and I think ongoing. God's not finished with me yet. Not by a long shot. I love that. <laughs> How do you think you overcame some of that shyness? So my mother, when I was 11, rather than, she, she got an inheritance and rather than, you know, doing something sensible like paying off a mortgage or getting a car that didn't break down every few months, um, she took me overseas um, to, and, and I mentioned earlier she's from the Netherlands, she took me to all her favourite places. Mm. So mm. the United States, the Netherlands, our family in Italy and France and wow. Germany and... Um, and then also to the Holy Land. So we, we sailed from Greece to Israel and spent time there. Um, and just seeing that my normal is not everybody's normal. Yeah. And we also wanted to go to South Africa, but my mother is white and I'm black. And so we, at that stage, we still would have been separated at some point. Oh so goodness. we didn't. Yeah, but, um, I think that was that was life-changing and it was yeah several things I think mm. along the way have given me incremental bits of confidence and now I'm right on the cusp between introvert and extrovert <laughs> well I've had just a great pleasure learning about you uh, I, I need to bring you back uh, <laughs> there's just so much more I want to ask uh, like who's faster at running you or your husband and your <laughs> husband's a three-time <laughs> Olympiad, I believe. Um, I like to end each Evening Rounds podcast with the following question. When you hear the word Evening Rounds or the term Evening Rounds, what does it mean to you? I probably don't have a good answer to that because in New Zealand we didn't have Evening Rounds. Um, so the term to me, when I first heard it and didn't know it was associated with it, I thought it might be sitting down and talking about cases of the day mm. um, and that that is a time to be able to talk through problems and to come together as a team. Well, I think that's a perfect answer for evening rounds. And I love that you joined us on this evening rounds because yes. <laughs> you didn't have it in New Zealand. <laughs> well, thank you. It's just such a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here at Loma Melinda, and I really thank you for inviting me as well. And it's amazing what you're doing. So thank you for your work that's actually getting things um, out to the, the people who need it the most. <laughs>